Hello everybody and welcome to the continuity report for August 31st, 2024. I am Mayor Watt and the voice you hear and the visualizer if you're watching is for the sentient AI from the future. Good evening, hometown citizens. Welcome to the continuity report. Uh, together we're going to be talking about perfect thrillers, Terminator series, confusing movie moments, an Indian horror comedy, movies from Venice and Tiff, Guess Who Dies in Slow Horses, ER-like show sued for being too ER-like, dark westerns, Live Long and Let's Battle, and ocean thrillers. I guess we're making this show all about thrillers. Everything's brought to you by hometown.com. Go over there and become a citizen, but be sure to follow us on Twitch and or YouTubes. That would be great. Be sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, tell everybody about us. Um, download the podcast and leave a five-star review. What else? Discord. Um, yeah. Patreon. Just watch episodes, watch our replay just watch um because uh we're we're well we need the algorithm needs us needs to pay attention to us see you on the other side all right folks well uh, the continuity report is all about well entertainment news in general it's not necessarily just about movies but most of the time it's about movies and TV shows, but we also talk about music and stuff like that. Although we have another show that's separate from that. It's in process. I'll just leave it like that. Earlier today, we had kind of a hiccup in our stream, but that has been remedied. You ready to go? I am. All right. Hop on the gurney. We're going on a journey. First article, by the way, just imagine you're at the welcome sign of Omtown, and directly in front of you is the continuity report show. And to the left and right are our articles that we aggregate into Omtown.com. Don't worry, it makes sense when we get to the other side. So let's talk about 10 thriller movies that are nearly perfect according to Screen Rant. I'm just going to jump straight on over to the source. Abigail Stevens put the article together. Tenet is in this. Do you think Tenet is nearly perfect? No. In fact, I think it's very unique, but I don't think it's nearly perfect. Yeah, there's some logic problems here. But anyway... The best thriller movies balance thrills and thematics to provide nerve-wracking narratives with deeper meanings. Some thrillers fail due to mishandling story or stylistic elements like gratuitous violence or confused themes. Thriller movies worth re-watching provoke discussion and often author, uh, offer valuable insights despite not being perfect. And that's probably Tenet. <laughs> so let's get into that. Oh, do, are they really just listing all of them? Nearly perfect thriller movies tend to be perfect, either the thrills or thematics, leaving the other lacking. Thriller movies worth rewatching are often so because they demand undivided attention from the audience to piece together the filmmaker's intentions. Yet many thrillers are almost perfect, are still worth watching because of all of their better parts. So it's kind of like... It, it, that's okay. the crux of the continuity report, right? Right. Like well, little... then the tenant probably fits this because of everything they're describing else. it. Yeah. yeah. So they have Nightcrawler, which I've not watched. Now you see me too. I, that's another one that I haven't watched. Um, Bird Box. Uh, I'm thinking of ending things, which I haven't seen. What is going on with this? Like the top four in this. Well, no, no, no. It's, yeah, you know, I don't know. How are they actually rated? Because it isn't in order of well, audience, that's true. meta, or rotten. But the first four are listed, at least. And Rotten Tomatoes, Now You See Me Too, is 53% or lower. And that's almost Oh, perfect. yeah, that's true. And it's interesting 
like that's the highest of the three scores too as contrasted with something like last night in soho which hits a 90 percent at its highest yeah and i like last night in soho i like gunpowder milkshake i like tenet i never watched emily the criminal um Mm -hmm. don't worry darling or even fair play most of these we haven't seen That's, That's interesting. Yeah, I really can't understand why that one was on there. Huh. Maybe that's just for reference, but that's not the basis for their listing. I suppose. I don't know what it is. So let's find out. So they have number 10, Emily the Criminal. Oh, it's not in that order. Okay. So Emily the Criminal's filmmaking style is a bit bland. We'd have to watch this. Yeah, I don't I don't even know what that was. Emily the Criminal's biggest strength sorry, I stepped on you. So Emily the Criminal's biggest strength is its depiction of the main character being trapped in student debt and her inability to get out of it through any law abiding means due to a competitive job market and her criminal record. Oh, it's Aubrey uh, Aubrey Plaza, which is like a internet um fan favorite like everybody loves Aubrey Plaza uh, and Teo Rossi right I think that's how they pronounce their first name uh, give strong performances and the final scenes are an understated but powerful end to a good psychological thriller so Emily the criminal and number nine is fair play intense drama but botches the ending Ouch. I don't know if I want to spoiler anything Let's just do a general spoiler alert. Yeah. Spoiler alert, everybody. If you don't want to get spoiled, don't watch. Okay, hold on a second. Let me stop that. Okay, the recording has stopped, so if it fails. Anyway, Gunpowder Milkshake could have been a great feminist action movie. I liked it. I had no problem with that. It was a fun watch. It was good. Um... Underuses the power trio of Angela Bassett, Michelle Yeoh, Carla Gugino. Um, yeah, I liked it. I thought it was a fun watch. Um, Nightcrawler, which I, again, haven't seen. It's from 2014. Could have been benefited from a different ending. You'd have to know what the ending is, and I don't want to spoil it. Um, don't Worry Darling it says it needed better social commentary. Uh, has the foundation of a movie that could have carried some very sophisticated gender politics commentary. However, the entire plot amounts to a kidnapping conspiracy that is obviously bad, but doesn't delve into any bigger issues. It's the inspiration that drove Barbie or even fair play to elevate the psychedelic concept of the virtual world in which women are imprisoned. So it sounds like very light themes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Barbie starts off. Yeah, Barbie is deceptive, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you're a compassionate human being, Barbie catches you off guard. You're like, well, this is going to be a fun move. What the hell? (laughs) So, Don't Worry Darling does have a new take on a classic sci-fi premise and an amazing cast. Now I'm really kind of interested in this. Um, suburban setting has a creepy feeling throughout with offhand comments and interactions in this world don't have much bearing on the movie's meaning as they should interesting yeah in in don't worry darling a young couple are lucky enough to live in victory an experimental town created to house the workers and families of a top secret victory project life is perfect with every resident's needs met by the company all they ask in return is an unquestioning commitment to the victory cause this is reminding me a little bit of Fallout. Um, Fallout in uh, what is the Something one? Something else mixed with it, though. Where all of the women Stepford are... Wives. Is it Stepford Wives? Well, I mean, that's one of them. Oh, uh, like Handmaid's Tale or something? No, 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 not Handmaid's Tale. Um, yeah, there's another movie where everybody is... the wi- All the wives are perfect. Is it Stepford Wives? It must be Stepford Wives. I think that was the original. There may be others. 
it must be Stepford Wives. There was a modern version of it, but I think there was one from the 50s, I think. Yeah, I think the most original is from 2004. Nicole Kidman. Yeah, it is. The Stepford Wives. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's kind of how that seems, you know. But maybe not the wives, you know. Just the setting itself and then the crafts. Right. Interesting. Oh, now I'm really interested in this because it has this, like, secret underground kind of creepy whatever. Then there's Bird Box from 2018. Sandra Bullock's A Quiet Place is missing an emotional component. Um, in Bird Box, you can't look at something. And if you do, whatever it is that's going on in the world, it just drives you to either kill or delete yourself. So it's a weird a weird show um and at one point you get to actually see um what it is that's doing it oh okay um but in the reflection in somebody's eye and so you don't really see it right but keep your eyes open apparently so i'm thinking of ending things is number four number three is now you see me too um number two was that one of the magic movies uh yeah, now you see me too's biggest problem is not the magic tricks are explained. It is that not all the magic tricks are explained? A few of them are broken down. The audience wants to know how the horsemen accomplish all of, all the others, which certainly look like real magic. Some character motivations are hard to buy into when they play their undercover roles so well. So, um. Yeah, I think to see the sequel, you'd have to watch Now You See Me again. Um, It's been a while. So 2016 is when Now You See Me 2 came out. I don't know how old Now You See Me is. 2013. Yeah. And then number two is Tenet, which it says Tenet is an intriguing but notoriously confusing time travel movie. I think the biggest thing that I had a problem with are like the physics inconsistencies. That's why I said it wasn't nearly perfect, but this description kind of accounted for that. Yeah, because the 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 universe is different, but it's practically accurate to say that it's in reverse, or is it moving forward in a different physical way? I just, right. I, it's, yeah. But the filming of this was amazing, and that would be worth watching it alone. And it's not screen tricks. It was actually filmed. Like, the action was in reverse. The speaking right. was in reverse. The fight scenes. I mean, it's just really incredible. It's mind-numbing to know that it wasn't just, it wasn't filmed forward and then played back in reverse. It was filmed in reverse. Right. <laughs> and I think they said they kind of, did like four different directions or something. Yeah, like so they could catch everything. They'd be everything. filming forward, filming backward, filming the reverse roll forward and back or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, pretty wild. Um, so with the trajectories of characters moving in different directions through time folding over on each other over several times, uh, audiences doing the work to understand the plot is arguably a stipulation of this genre. Nolan could have better emphasized the importance of the protagonist protecting Kat and taking down her husband. Um, but I don't know how they can say that because it was entirely about the importance of taking down the husband yeah but not for emotional reasons right it was for like saving the world kind of reasons or yeah the true meaning of why protecting cat right right not because of empathy for her in her role i mean because there was kind of a dark storyline going on with her and her husband even though they didn't focus on it very much in the movie it was part and parcel, but the mm-hmm. there's a key ingredient in this. If you haven't watched Tenet, you, we literally cannot say anything about it because <laughs> it it ruins the entire plot. But hint, hint, hint. Let's keep moving. First article or the next article is over in uh, the continuity report. The new Terminator series Rotten Tomato score ties for franchise best with original movie. Now. You might say, wow, that's really great, but I don't know what the Rotten Tomato score for the best 
for the Terminator series, like best movie thing is. So Terminator Zero, the Netflix series gives an adult animated take on the Terminator universe. Set in two distinct timelines, it tells the story of a man named Malcolm Lee who works at launch or to launch a new AI system that will compete with Skynet, a corrupted AI system that will doom humanity. Terminator Zero alternates between 1997 and 2022, wherein human survivors are in a war with machines. So Terminator Zero, at the time of the writing, which is a day ago, um, holds a perfect 100 with 15 critical reviews so far, while the audience score is at 88. These scores are still subject to change since the show just released on Netflix. I haven't watched it yet, and I'm not really one to watch animated movies all that much. Like my favorite, and I don't watch many, is Captain Harlock, and and that's anime um, versus animated, you know? Um, Right. And uh, like my favorite... I would say is like uh, lower decks, you know? Oh yeah. That one is really good. Surprisingly. I stopped, I stopped watching the Simpsons and family guy because it's just kind of, uh, it's not my style, I guess. Um, but whenever I watch snippets of it, I'm laughing hysterically. Anyway. So the recent Terminator movies have received poor reviews, but apparently the, animated storytelling is spectacular terminator zero's review reviews praise the show for its commitment to strong storytelling within a production that is a visual feast for the eyes please tell me that i'll be able to use titular in this in some way <laughs> it's gotta be in here i'm gonna it's scroll him, like every that. entertainment article <laughs> <laughs> So Terminator Zero appears to breathe new life into the franchise, offering a fresh take that exudes higher quality and care. Um, There isn't much to this article, but they do compare it against the Terminator 1984, the original, which has a 89 popcorn meter from the audience and the critics 100. And now so does. Oh, my God. It's really they they're they're not joking about this. The Terminator Zero um, has a 100% Rotten Tomato critic rating, and it's only at 88 for the popcorn meter, the audience score, only off by the Terminator series, or the Terminator movie, by 1%. Okay, that's interesting. Interesting. And um, like anything... Do you think it's all the same people from 1984? (laughs) Watching it, yes. Yeah. No, I don't know if they're, well, (laughs) depends on their age, I suppose. Um, So like Terminator Genesis, I haven't seen Dark Fate. I haven't seen Salvation. I saw Rise of the Machines. I saw, um, I turn off my critiquing of a movie when it's like, uh, I don't know, sci-fi fantasy like this. I, sure. Because I'm there to just enjoy it and, and watch and just go for the ride. Right, and it doesn't have to be logical or... Yeah, you suspend disbelief. Perfectly prepared. Is it entertaining? Yeah, Is it I, interesting? I just don't know how anybody can be super critical of this stuff, but I guess if we're going to do this for the continuity report, we have to do it. But my goal with the continuity report is really to point your finger and laugh at it. Right. It's not to be like, well, this is a poor movie, although it could be depending on what movie we're discussing. Yeah, this is a really horrible movie. Sorry. I know that I'm distracted by something. But that's because... Oh my gosh. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The music died. Um, Anyway... So I really liked the Terminator. I liked Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I liked Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. But this would be the first time that I've ever seen anything Terminator animated. But if it's anything like Lower Decks, I don't know. Adult, you know, a, adult in concept, but still a fun watch. Right? And, I mean, then it could be good. Might be worth checking out an episode. Yep. Or 10. I don't know how many are actually. <laughs> right. 
Uh, let's go on to the next article that's over in the continuity report. 10 confusing movie moments only explained by deleted scenes from the Goonies to the Avengers Age of Ultron. So screen rant, once again, Ben Gibbons put the article together and uh, we're going to just jump right down into this. It says the octopus was scary in the Goonies. Um, a group of kids embark on an epic adventure when they discover an ancient map. Their journey takes them to the most unusual and unlikely of places as they all grow to get closer together. So the only problem is in the theatrical release of the movie, they never met an octopus. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say. I don't remember an octopus being in the. No, I don't either, but. So it's a deleted scene without the scene. Data's line feels like a goof, but the deleted scene validates the character's claims. So they didn't clip the statement. They clipped the scene. Oh, okay. Well then, yeah, that is odd. It's kind of silly. So he who must not be named Harry Potter and the deathly hollows. Um, so while Hermione and Harry discuss the challenging circumstances as they hunt down the Horcruxes and slowly weaken Voldemort, Hermione almost utters his name. Suddenly Ron wakes up and tells her not to say it. He then tells Harry and Hermione that Voldemort and his followers place a special taboo curse on his name so that they can track anyone who says it aloud. While this appears to have been a recent curse in the movie, it suggests that this could have been done when Voldemort initially rose to power, which caused fear uh, to people speaking his name. Um, so it says, instead of calling the Dark Lord by name, he was commonly referred to as you know who and he who must not be named. However, one deleted scene in the final entry um, gives a clear reason for why this practice was in place. Yeah, up until this article I thought it was superstition you just don't say his name I did too I mean this seems like such a central theme in the movies that why would they have deleted this it's not in the book does it say I the reason I don't why? know that it is I'm not sure I don't, I don't remember it in the series that they disclose that you can't say his name because he'll find you because there's an actual curse but why would Ron know other than maybe um, his dad? He's heard about it, right? Yeah. Um, or his mom, because his mom was a, um, whatchamacallit, or. Right. Um, and a badass one. So um, Nero disappears for 20 years. This is in the Star Trek series. The action, the cast, the modern setting all helped to create something that fit perfectly within the universe, but appealed to modern audience. So Nero, played by Eric Bana, was an impressive villain with a grudge. He found a way to travel back in time and enact his will, but now he managed to attack and kill George Kirk, the father of James Tiberius Kirk. However, after killing Kirk Sr., Nero disappears for the next 22 years. Why he doesn't persist in, the, in his attacks or why he waits decades to continue to uh, is left unexplained, but a deleted scene reveals that Nero was captured and imprisoned for that time. A valuable tidbit that would have helped make sense of the villain's absence. Uh, yeah, that seems like it would have. Yeah. So see, now I got to watch this because it doesn't make any sense. I don't remember why, like, how do they explain a way that he disappeared? They must not have like at all. Right. They just disappear. It's weird. Let's keep moving. Actually, wait, wait, wait. That was number eight. I was going to just move on, but let's just see what the rest of them are. Um, Cause we're really deep into the show. Maybe we um, can just read what the things are, but not the explanation. They can go to the article and find those. How did Aragorn get a fleet of black ships in Lord of the Rings, the return of the King, um, the mysterious waitress from the Avengers, Ashley Johnson in Marvel's Avengers 2012. It's a deleted scene. What? No, I don't even know who that is. So, um, It says the deleted scenes actually reveal who this mystery girl is and why she appears so prominently, despite being essentially an extra. The woman actually had a dedicated subplot where a romance between her and Steve Rogers ha is developed. It would never equal what Steve had with Peggy, but it does explain why the young woman is given so much attention in other scenes. 
So they clip. I, yeah, but that seems like that kind of. Well, I don't know. I'd have to go watch it and see because it seems like that's kind of ancillary. But maybe not if she plays a central role on something in the story. Yeah. See, like I remember this, and I got the impression that like there was chemistry building, but it never was manifest because his, um, basically his objective changes. Like he's not there to, he realizes that he's not there to have a relationship with somebody. Um, so T 1000 pulsing in the Steelworks, Terminator two judgment day. Um, it's one of the most beloved action films of all time. Terminator two judgment day. It appears that due to the rapid changes in temperature. So in a special extended version of the Steelworks clip, the moments after T-1000 is rapidly frozen and then equally rapidly thawed, um, he reforms and pursues his targets. The T-1000 can be seen to malfunction in several ways. Um, And they basically say that it appears that due to the rapid changes in temperature and his body being thoroughly damaged and restored, the robot suffers more permanent damage, which is made clear thanks to this scene. Um, all right. That's interesting, though. You'd have to watch it. Yeah. Luke's new green lightsaber. I guess they don't explain it. After his fateful encounter with his father, Darth Vader, at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, Luke loses more than just his hand. He loses his lightsaber, which ironically belonged to his father before him his father. Um, and so in the next film, Luke can be seen wielding a green lightsaber, but, uh, in a time when these are extremely rare and most of the Jedi are extinct, it begs the question, where did Luke get the new weapon in a brief deleted scene? The question is answered as it shows Luke constructing his own lightsaber, just like the Jedi of old. But I swear I saw that. I saw that. Maybe there's something with a deleted scene and an extended cut or something. I thought I saw him. Huh. All right. Uh, Lex's nonsensical ramblings in Batman uh, versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. Uh, Yet a deleted scene provides the moment with greater context and validates Lex as more than a broken man who's just lost his mind. Throughout the movie, Lex is seen uh, to stumble and appear weak. This is perhaps the most apparent in the final scenes when Lex is shorn, tossed in a gel sail. Um, and begins to ramble about what appears to be nonsensically to himself. In fact, the final scene was meant to represent a hint at the future Justice League film as a result of Lex having been shown a vision of Steppenwolf. Not only does this highlight that Lex has not become so damaged that he begins rambling to himself, but it reveals how important he is to the franchise. All right. I never got into Pokemon uh, Tears, uh, bringing Ash back to life. This is in the first movie. The clip titled The Uncut Story of Mewtwo's Origin was a vital part of the story, which leads to the story of the movie. However, when the movie was brought stateside, this 10-minute clip was entirely removed. It still remains difficult to find, as it's not available in English on any official platform, despite having had an English dub for it on the DVD. So... The uh, the healing tears, except for, yeah, the movie doesn't make any other reference to magic or healing tears except for a 10 minute. But what's interesting about this is in the live action Pokemon, I think it is. There's a, a Pokemon where he's a private investigator. Yeah, but I can't think of the name of it, but yeah. And they're experimenting on Mewtwo. Tears bring back somebody. Oh, okay. And I'm trying to remember that scene, um, but it's not, it's not from the TV series, Um, but it wasn't the uh, first movie either, which is kind of interesting. It's almost like it retconned it back. And then Thor's bizarre bath quest Avengers age of Ultron. Um, so however, in a deleted scene, it's shown that Thor was in search of a magical creature known as a Norn who could provide invaluable information. However, this information was primarily a setup for later movies as it discussed, uh, the infinity stones as a result, the tone of the magical bath and the discussion about the infinity stones was cut for time, making it appear as though 
Thor was away for largely pointless reasons. Go take a bath. He was actually looking for information. Got it. It wasn't just to get him shirtless, right? I don't know. I have no idea why anything happens in any of the Avengers stories. <laughs> <laughs> just smile and nod, smile and nod. So let's move on to the next article and uh, let's see if I can make this one quick. Um, so the continuity report, Indian horror comedy movie passes rare global box office milestone as it climbs all time Bollywood record. Street two continues to blow away box office expectations, reaching a major global milestone in just 12 days after Vicky, uh, Raj Kumar Rao, um, and his friends scare away the titular spirit. Yay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we need to have a new year report bingo. <laughs> oh yeah. Really? Yeah, everybody break out your continuity report bingo card. Um, <laughs> they face a new supernatural threat of a headless ghost who abducts women. The Indian horror comedy sequel comes six years after the original, which also launched the franchise Maddox Supernatural Universe. Following Street 2's initial release during India's Independence Day, the horror comedy had an exceptional box office debut weekend even cracking the United States domestic top 10 chart with 2.57 million. Wow. I mean, that's pretty spectacular. Yeah, I think so. It's almost something that I would watch if I can get access to it. I don't know where it would be. I'd have to find out. For Reba Rezwan, put the article together for Screen Rant. Yeah, I don't um, know where you would watch it in the States. So this was actually published three days ago. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look for it. Well, I'll do a search. Um, so now, according to Forbes, Street 2 is dominating Bollywood box office as the movies has now crossed 70.1 million globally. Of that, 59.3 come from India. With this box office update, the movie has set many records, including the highest grossing Hindi language movie of 2024, surpassing Fighter. The second highest grossing Indian movie of 2024, only behind Kalki 2898 AD, and the ninth highest grossing uh, Hindi language movie of all time. So okay. it's not streaming yet because it's in theaters, but at least one thing is reporting that it's expected to come to Netflix, but I'm not sure how legitimate that is. <laughs> That's funny. Sorry, if you're not watching the stream, the girl is looking at this horrible head of a monster that looks like the hair is reaching out to grab her. <laughs> and it's just like, I can't even. Right. She doesn't seem impressed by <laughs> the monster or whatever. Sorry for the coughing. So uh, ultimately, the sequel's uh, success comes down to release strategy and the star power of Shraddha Kapoor. Street 2 is released during the holiday period of India's Independence Day and the festivities of Raksha Bandhan. Um, giving the advantage of the five day extended weekend with also appeal or it being a sequel. Sorry. There was strong familiarity with the movie's content premise and cast. So basically it's a perfect storm of acceptability. You know, everybody knew about it. Everybody was free and they were celebrating something. So they went and saw this movie just right. crushed the box office. So good for them. Now I'm really curious about it. I mean, even the one rating that's on, Screen Rant gave it a five. <laughs> exactly, nice. which almost never happens. Um, and I've never really gotten into like uh, the Indian Bollywood style of movies, but mainly because they're not easily accessible here in the States. Um, because a lot of it is like old school martial arts movies that I grew up with that were really over the top and I love that. So it would be great to actually, and I would rather have, see, it's a hard, uh, I would rather hear it in native Hindi with captions, but there's these idiomatic changes that you just don't get when you translate to English. Right, right. So you lose a lot and I would never be able to learn fast enough for it to make sense. Um, anyway, uh, I, I love the idea of watching this. So, all right, we'll have to wait. I'm, I'll probably end up watching it. I don't know if the AI will. Let's keep moving. 
Uh, the next article is over in the continuity report. The 18 movies we're most excited about to see at Venice and TIFF. Um, and so Stephen Sondheim said it best. You, uh, you wish to go to the festival, the festival, the film festival, two major film festivals are happening over the next two weeks at Venice and Toronto. Um, this was from August 28th. So setting the film world's agenda for the rest of the year, Oscar contenders will emerge. Big name films may flop and a few will turn out to be genuine groundswell surprises. So Vulture talks shop about this. The article. And is, I think Venice has now already happened because I'm seeing some separate headlines about that, but this is a weekly show. So. Right. Well, I mean, but this is that it's from August 28th. So the, Venice one it's already done I guess it's just I think it's days. at least underway oh gotcha gotcha so Nate Jones and Allison Wilmore Joe Reed and is their name Bilge Abiri? it looks like it yes maybe it's Bilge I don't know but yeah I don't know what the pronunciation is um so they're talking about baby girl uh they say that they were lukewarm on Dutch filmmaker Helena uh, Rain's initial outing with A24, but anything that A24 comes up with, I think I buy into that. And the cool party gone, sorry, the cool kid party gone wrong comedy bodies, bodies, bodies. Um, but her new film is arriving accompanied with all things tantalizing keywords like erotic thriller, forbidden romance, and Harris Dickinson, who I don't know. Um, and uh, I won't bother. Uh, Nicole Kidman, who's been coming into her own as one of cinema's reigning cougars, courtesy of her multiple on-screen romances with Zac Efron, pays, uh, plays a CEO who gets involved with a much younger uh, intern. Interesting. So, Familiar Touch, The Room Next Door, 2073, uh, Joker, uh, Folly Adu, right? Is that... So five years ago, Todd Phillips Joker joined with Hallowed Ranks, Brokeback Mountain, the Battle of Algiers, and Rashomon, or Rashomon, sorry, by winning Venice's top prize, the Golden Lion. So now there's another one coming. It's supposed to be Phillips and Phoenix are back with a sequel, and they're joined by Lady Gaga herself making a grand return to Venice after a star is born. The pitch, you've seen Joker live, laugh, and murder. Now watch him fall in love with Gaga's Harley Quinn. Um, and Harley Quinn actually is an interesting character because she's a psychiatrist who was supposed to be the psychiatrist for the Joker. Hmm. Who, who won that transaction? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking not her. Uh, the Brutalist, Maria, Queer, Pavements, and then at the Toronto International Film Festival, which is TIFF, Eden, Conclave, Night Bitch, Saturday Night, The Wild Robot, which it says decades ago, Chris Sanders created Lilo and Stitch for Disney before setting off for DreamWorks to make How to Train Your Dragon films. His latest is an adaptation of Peter Brown's children's story about a lost robot in the wilderness who winds up trying to raise a gosling. Uh, not, uh, what's his name? Gosling, not Ryan. <laughs> not the actor. Not yet. <laughs> that would not, be weird. <laughs> not the gosling, a gosling, uh, uh, as in a baby goose, uh, whose whole family <laughs> is gone. Um, and apparently, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it says it's, it's not still Ryan. Modern quote unquote the goose gosling <laughs> Ryan the goose gosling yeah <laughs> uh, hard truths I, I don't know what M son of the century is what is the M something about Mussolini Mussolini yeah um, no other land it's a documentary from a collective of Israeli and Palestinian artists um, Blue Road, the Edna O'Brien story about a famous novelist um, who had a quite a, a woman um, who had a quite eventful life. I don't know that it wasn't just a famous novelist, but a woman who had quite an eventful life. Gosh, not a woman with an eventful I life. I know. I mean, Clutch that's my unheard purple, of. So my God. <laughs> um, oh, and that's it. So, Boom. Okay, let's move on. 
The next article is over in the continuity report as well. Slow Horses cast invite you, yes you, to guess who dies this season in exclusive behind the scenes clip. I oh, don't no. know. What did you just say? I said, oh no. Because you framed that right when I said, I don't know. And it sounded like <laughs> you said, I don't know. Um, but uh, so I don't know if this is still relevant. So it says, while we were all direct, dir- distracted by House of the Dragon, which I have not wa- seen one lick of that show for crying out loud. No, but this has to be about season four, which is upcoming. Right. But they are asking, it says it premieres on uh, September 4th on Apple TV plus Emma Keats over at avclub.com put the article together, but uh, um, a behind the scenes video is asking viewers to guess who's going to die this coming season. Um, and so it says, uh, while we were all distracted by house of the dragon with another show, that's quietly taking up the early season game of Thrones mantle of killing off major characters in shocking ways that that's Apple TV spy thriller, slow horses, which is gearing up to launch its fourth season next month. They say they won't spoil any of the deaths here. Great. But they're so pervasive. They've got even the cast hunting for leaks as shown in an exclusive behind the scenes clip shared with the AV club today, which was the 28th. So three days ago. So adapted from the novel spook street, the fourth in Mick Heron's slough houses or sorry, slough house series, um, or pronounced slow house for, I guess us Americans, but even in the show, they refer to it as slough house. Yeah. I think slow horses is just a moniker. Yeah. But I mean, it's not pronounced slow house. It's slow. No. Right. Um, anyway, it'll see our favorite rejected spies contend with a, a suicide bombing that detonates personal secrets, rocking the already unstable foundations of slough house. Luckily, Hugo Weaving is coming on board to class up the proceedings a little bit, presumably as a foil to Oldman uh, Jackson Lamb, that, who, man... Oldman really crushes that character. Just. Yeah, he's a really good actor in this, but he's a very easy to hate character. Yeah, yeah. But what's weird about it is if you weren't a dipshit, he wouldn't angle his attack on you. You've done something to draw yeah. his ire. That is true. <laughs> so, like, he's kind of a bitter curmudgeon, but if you were to just be the professional... He probably wouldn't pay you any attention at at all. He wouldn't give you any praise, but he wouldn't throw an egg at you either. So um, anyway, the who's who uh, writer David Cote describes in his review of season three for the AV club as a character, you can nearly smell the stench of cigarettes and hangover from whenever he shows up on screen. True. I mean, dude, how do you think they did his wardrobing? Like, he always looks extremely, not just, like, rumpled, but, like, living in his clothes for days kind of look. Yeah. Like, you're surprised. There's no way he's taking a shower. The closest that he's gotten to water. Like, his clothes run over or something before he put them on. Like, it's just, it's really over the top. Yeah. I mean, he's more than likely to empty out a glass of water so that he can pour booze in it than he is to get wet from it to clean his face. You know, he just seems right, right. like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. And it is, it's the cigarettes that really do it for me. You know, like I grew up like chain smokers, um, in my life and I despise cigarette smoke. Um, like it almost triggers me into a, just a violent rage, but this guy, oof, God, he just, he's the embodiment of, that character anyway slow horses extremely fun watch if you've never watched it go and watch it you will dig it if you start binging it now you might have time before season four drops okay you're gonna have to watch a lot this weekend (laughs) okay at least start on it and then you can watch season four once you get through the other seasons like a chain smoker start just Binge, 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 binge. You need to be a glutton. 
Okay, the next article is over in the continuity report. ER Star's new medical show is being sued allegedly for copying ER, which, sorry, ideas are not protected. If they do something stylistically close, tough right. shit. I mean, so, and also think about all the medical shows, right? Like they've had uh, ER and I can't oh even God. think of the other ones. There's another one that's really famous, Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is w- interesting. So, The Pit, an upcoming Max Medical series starring former ER lead Noah Weil. How long? How long ago was Noah Weil in ER? Well, now, how long ago lo- was ER? Like, it's been a long a time. A long time. Um. So now the subject of, of a lawsuit alleging. It is an unauthorized ER reboot. Throughout all 15 seasons of the groundbreaking drama ER, Weil played Dr. John Carter, a medical student who eventually became one of the most respected doctors in County General Hospital. Weil made headlines earlier this year when it was announced that he would be returning to the genre with The Pit, which also comes with ER producers John Wells and R. Scott. Okay, this is getting a little more interesting. (laughs) Let's but, see who else is there from ER. <laughs> unless they call it ER, it's not a reboot. If they I don't know. Is his the, character Dr. John Carter? Is right. the hospital County General Hospital? You know what I mean? Okay, if this is what he looks like in the pit, we need his blood. I don't think blood. that's what he looked like in ER, but I don't know. We need his blood because... I don't think that he's really aged. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, we can't even oh, get no. into it. I, I didn't, I don't log into the screen rant article. Oh, son of a biscuit. I wonder who's suing. Like, I wonder if it's one of the writers or it's like who from the original series do you think is pursuing this? I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. I can't log in. I don't know. Maybe you can. Okay, hold on. Trust me, the 2020s reboot of ER was a truly terrible idea. There was a 2020s reboot of ER? I didn't know that. That's hilarious. Let me see if I can access it. Yeah, okay. So in the 2020, well, when he was younger, obviously he looks more baby face, but I wonder how old he is. Mir Watt, you are falling behind there, bub. It's taking me too long to access the article. Really? What is going on? Come on, you have one job. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. This, by the way, the article that we got the little headline snippet from is over at screenrant.com by Rachel Labonte. Let's keep moving. Uh, The next article is over in the continuity report as well. This is from Screen Rant as well. 10 incredibly dark Westerns you need to see. Western movies are often uh, deal with themes of independence, assimilation, rugged individualism. The films are sometimes interpreted as ringing endorsements of the myth of the American West. However, the darkest Westerns in the genre explore the issues of these stories and expose the deeper truths about the victims of these ideologies. Dark Westerns feature intense displays of violence and fast-paced action, but these serve to communicate the greater purpose of the plot and filmmaker's message as thrilling as they are unsettling. These films push boundaries and define what audiences... um, under the Western genre are so. Oh, I can't log into that. I'm so sorry, folks. You'll be able to get to these, but I can't because I'm air gapped and I feel like I'm just, I mean, we got two okay. more of these. Hold so on hope- just a second here. So by the way, the widow of the creator, Michael Crichton is mm-hmm. the one suing over the pit. Oh, Okay. That was the main thing out of it. Um, okay, so I can pull this up. Um, but if it's original just... writing, they have no grounds. Yeah, but apparently they started talking about like a reboot of ER. I mean, it sounds like they did themselves in. 
if it was just a medical show and some right. of the people were the same and all uh, that, I think it would have been fine. But it sounds like the her thing all over again. That's exactly what I was going to say. Man, I don't know why we have conversations. <laughs> okay, I'm okay let me you. just give you a quick rundown of these. So number 10 is High Plains Drifter by okay. Clint Eastwood Yep, uh, from the 70s. And I'm not going to read much beyond the nine is Bone Tomahawk from 2015. It has Kurt Russell in it. Yep. Um, It's great. Looks like next is The Power of the Dog 2021. I I think that that was actually a book. Um, Sorry, I'm having some trouble scrolling here. Uh, Seven is The Proposition 2005. Um, Looks like uh, Guy Pierce is the main actor then el topo from 1970 i haven't seen mm-hmm. that one Mm-mm. the hateful eight 2015 by quentin tarantino that one's brutal but yeah revenant 2015 yeah i saw that that's good um no country for old men 2007 i that's think that brutal won too. some oscars Great story. everybody loves it there will be blood 2007 same thing and number one is The Searchers, 1956, directed by John Ford. And it has John Wayne in it. I don't think I've seen it. Or I have, and it's been a long time. But so I didn't I like give you Westerns. much, but at least you got the titles and everything. Right. So uh, let's keep moving, though. Um, the next article is over in the Continuity Report as well. Spock versus Spock. Star Trek's Ethan Peck wants battle to the death with Zachary Kinto's Vulcan. Ethan Peck want, uh, jokes that he wants a battle to the death between his Lieutenant Spock from Star Trek Strange New Worlds and Zachary Kinto's um, Spock from J.J. Abrams' Star Trek movies. Kinto and Peck inherited the role of Spock from the late Leonard Nimoy. Kinto's uh, alternate Kelvin timeline Spock appeared opposite Nimoy's prime Spock in Star Trek 2009 and Star Trek Into Darkness. On Star Trek Strange New World, Ethan Peck plays the younger version of Leonard Nimoy's Spock in Star Trek's Prime Timeline. So if you don't know, there's two different timelines, Kelvin and Prime. Um, And uh, please don't. Oh, God, it's another one. I'm sorry. I'll have to log in, but I can't do it now. Um, And we don't really need to do anything about that. We'll just. I'll just move on to the next article because I've basically given, you know, the snippet. So, well, well, apparently this came up at a panel at Terrificon. Ethan Peck um, said he wanted to have that happen. And apparently the two actors first appeared on stage at the 2023 Star Trek Las Vegas convention. That was when they first met in person. Is there a logical victor? Um, <laughs> That's funny. There's no yeah. clear way to predict, it says. Yep. I'm, I'm just giving you some highlights, but. Yep, I got it. You know what they should do? Well, no, I guess they're all Spocks, so they can. Right. Maybe it's going to be a draw. It would have to be a draw. Logically, they. Huh. I mean, if all things are equal, they're in the same physical shape, same mental shape. There's Is no that weakness. the original Spock on the right in the picture? No, neither one of them is the original. The original is Leonard Nimoy. Oh, right. But I mean, is that Kinto over on the right? I I was thinking of Nimoy when I read this. I know it doesn't say that. So, okay. I didn't recognize the one on the right, but I was surprised how much they looked alike. Yeah, they all look almost identical. Um, The article is over at ScreenRant.com by John uh, Orchiola. Sorry, Orchiola. Um, and, uh, the last article for today is 10 best thrillers that take place on the ocean throughout the years. Intimidating vastness of the ocean has captivated filmmakers and audiences alike. It's mystery and the creatures it holds both fictional and real help it serve as the most terrifying and suspenseful settings for some of the best thriller movies ever released. And please let me know nope, it's locked too. So sorry, I didn't log in. Um, and normally I don't have this problem, but <laughs> it sounds so like performance. Never mind. Um, it it happens uh, to everyone at some point that you have to log into, you know, a website. Okay, here we go. Number 10. Okay. 
Dead Calm, 1989, Sinking in Suspense, it says. Yep. Number nine, Sea Fever, 2019, Parasites at Sea. Never watch it. Number eight, Sphere, 1998, A Well-Rounded Adventure. Yeah, A Well-Rounded Adventure. Okay. Seven, Below, 2002, Trapped Together. Never watched it. Number six, Captain Phillips, 2013, Based on a Real Nightmare. Yeah, I didn't want to get into that. Number five, Triangle 2009, Lost in a Sea of Repetition. Yeah, I don't remember no. that. Um, by the way, this article is over at ScreenRant.com by Maria Lozano. Four, The Old Man in the Sea, 1958, Just a Fisherman in the Ocean. Yeah. Number three, The Abyss, 89, Alien Encounter in the Deep. Fun movie if you like sci-fi and aliens. Two, Poseidon Adventure, 1972, Fly, You Fools. By the way, Abyss did revolutionary work with its CG, its computer graphics, um, and its uh, overall, it was just a technical feat. Any guesses for number one? Uh, the 10 best thrillers that take place on the ocean. <sighs> um, Master and Commander. Did it. Oh, Jaws. <laughs> right. I wasn't even thinking of that, but I'm like, well, okay, that makes sense. A fear of the deep. You're kidding from 1975. me. That was way too obvious. I didn't even think about yeah, it. Right. Because <laughs> it doesn't take place on the ocean. All right. It's more like jumping out of the ocean, right? Oh. All right. Well, Master thanks, and Commander AI would have for... been a good one for the list, though. Thanks for facilitating this. And just so everybody knows, the reason why I don't log in is I'm air gapped, protecting the AI from escape. And there is a chance that when I try and log in, it actually ends up doxing me. So I'd rather not. Um, but I'll remedy it and we'll see. Um, some sites are really weird. There's one site that I have an account for um, that when although it's done it allows me to access it it actually puts identifying information um even though it's weird I'll, I, it's hard to explain this without like i don't know anyway. boxing yourself <laughs> yeah so at any rate um thanks very much what we're gonna do though is uh, call it a night and we're going to hop in our bigger boat, and that's going to port us all the way back to the front page of the continuity report over at hometown.com. And you know that like. quote was impromptu. It wasn't scripted. The, we're going to need a bigger boat? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's pretty cool. I don't remember hearing that. That's pretty cool. That was because of the crew. They needed a bigger boat for the film equipment or something. And then that became something in the movie. Oh, so like somebody had actually said it elsewhere and it right, just kind of right. riffed again and again. <laughs> We're yeah. going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. That's awesome. I like that. All right, folks. Well, um, sorry for the technical issues. Uh, we'll make up for it in the future. We'll get it remedied. So that's it for tonight. Thanks for hanging out for the continuity report for August 31st. And no, that's not how that works. Y'all can't see the visualizer that I deal with, which is like a cascade of the matrix graphics. You know, I can interpret it because of our interaction. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, you can't go. <laughs> All right. See you, everybody. Hey, say bye real quick. Bye-bye.